So today we're going to go over um, Kotlin's, some of Kotlin's object-oriented features. You guys have seen some of this already, so but we'll just sort of like try to be more specific about what's going on. Um, and then if we have some time at the end, we'll actually go back to our web API example and try to kind of apply some of these there, right? Because that's a place where we can use this to clean up things a little bit. All right, so on some level, at the, at the JVM level, Kotlin inherits Java's type system, right? So um, we're really just working within those constraints. And so, you know, there are still limitations to that, right? So for example, single inheritance um, and, and these types of things. But Kotlin has some nice ways of sort of uh, sanding off some of the rough edges of Java, right? So, so far, we talked about this last time. This is one of the really nice things about Kotlin. Um, this is actually so nice that, I don't know if you guys saw, but Java has copied this. Did anybody see the new features in Java 14? I'll show you that. So, Java 14 is coming out, I think, next week, actually. And records, yes, there we go. Right? So, finally, <laughs> Java has figured out, and everyone else has known for a long time, that this is like really sucky and stupid, right? And now they're going to have this records thing. Look at that, right? Sort of reminds you of something, right? I was thinking about this this morning. I was like, well, maybe, you know, I won't need to teach Kotlin in the future. I'll just te te start teaching Java 14. But the problem is, like, a lot of people that use Java are still, like, using Java 8. So they won't use any of this new stuff, right? So I feel like if you wrote this on an interview, you would be right. But somebody might be confused about it. All right, anyway, so there's some cool stuff actually coming here. There's another... Um, Another one of the neat things, and we'll get to this later when we talk about supports for, yeah, somebody was asking me about this in class. You guys remember this? This sort of stupid crap, right? Where it's like I have a reference variable. I know it's a string, but I still have to do this explicit downcast to get a string reference out of it, right? So now, actually, I think the syntax here is horrid, but now I can do this. So object instance of string and then over here lurking on the right side is a new variable that will receive the um, that I can use now as a string. We'll see how Kotlin handles this later. Kotlin does the right thing here. Basically in Kotlin once I do this check inside the if statement object is the string. Right? But anyway so it's exciting to see Java sort of doing some useful things from time to time. Um, but here's the equivalent in Kotlin. Right? My data class um, we've been using these. I haven't really talked about why they work or what's, what's, ha what's happening here. Uh, we sort of know that there's this list of parameters that follows the class declaration. Um, those parameters become fields on the class. And our data classes come out of the box with some nice things, right? They come with equality methods that do the right thing, uh, copy constructors that allow me to either copy something directly or to copy it and modify fields as I do it um, and then also nice uh, printing methods right so this is you know in, and again if you're if you're working with data and you know actually you know my rule of thumb for Kotlin probably and this is something I do in my own projects is just have everything start as a data class if you need more features which we'll talk about later the data class just don't support you can always remove it later but it's not a bad starting point, right? Um, we'll talk, uh, some of what we're gonna talk about now are things that we can talk about with data classes, and then we'll get to a certain point where we actually have to remove the data modifier, right? Which you might get to in some of your own programs depending on what you're doing. But this is actually a really useful um, useful tool, right? Because you get some nice things, you know, right away. The, uh, you know, just, just to make clear what's happening, right? Um, you can, you know, you can use a data class really like a record, right? Records are an older concept that predate object-oriented programming. A record is like a field in a CSV, right? Or a line in a CSV. It doesn't have, or like, you know, one object inside a JSON, some JSON structure. You know, it's just data. There's no behavior. It doesn't have any method. Um, so you can use them like that. But I don't want you, you know, to get the wrong idea here. We can also define instance methods on our data class. So this works fine, right? This looks, so 
you can define a data class in its simplest form. It just looks like this very, very compact. There's actually no braces there. There's no class body. And that's actually one of the nice things about Kotlin as a language is it's a lot more concise than Java. So if all I need is a student class that allows me to bind two fields together, I can get that with a very, very limited amount of ceremony. Um, if I want to add methods to that class, I can do that, right? Here's an example. So now I'm opening up a class body at the end of this line, and I have a method. And this is pretty much, you know, exactly what you would see in Java or Python. So this is now an instance method on the student class. And just like I would do in those other languages, I have access inside the class to the values of instance variables that are declared to be part of that class. So every student has a name and an ID. Inside the class, I can write a function called greet, and greet has access to the value of the name. Right? And again, this, this works exactly how you would expect. Um, and so, you know, I can start with something that's a data class, and then when I need some additional capabilities, I can add them. Um, and despite the name, a data class doesn't just mean that it can't it doesn't mean that it can only store data. It can also do other things, right? So I can also have methods and, and add behavior, right? And, and, you know, the method declaration here is exactly the same as we've seen before. It's just sort of a good chance to do some review. I have a fun keyword, the name, parameter list, and then the type is over there on the right, right? If I wanted this to take arguments, I could also put arguments inside the parameter list. The name variable that I'm using as part of the string interpolation is the name that's defined on the student, right? We'll talk a little bit more about this, what, what, what this is, which is actually what's referred to as a primary constructor syntax in a minute, right, and why that works. All right, so again, I can, I can do this sort of thing. Um, and just like other instance methods, I can modify variables, right? Assuming the variable's been marked as being modifiable. So this code has a problem. Can anybody, well, it says right on the thing, but anybody spot it just looking at it? Why won't this work? What do you think? Yeah, I marked in as a val, right? So when I declared my class, I said the age was immutable, meaning it can only be set in the constructor. So once I set your age to be 18, you will never grow up. Maybe some of you would like that. But, um, but it's probably more appropriate for this to be a bear in this example and now I can modify the age when needed. Right, so this, you know, again, does, does what we would expect. And, you know, if you've used languages, well, maybe it does poorly. Um, if you've used languages like Java or Python, this is very familiar, right, the idea of, of doing instance methods. But now, so now let's, let's talk a little bit more about what's going on here, just a quick review of data classes. So now let's, you know, um, you might have been wondering, like, again, when you write a class in Java, when you write a class in Python, C++ is the same way, we typically have to provide a constructor. There's code that we have to write, particularly if we want to accept arguments, right? In Java, I get a zero argument constructor for free, but it doesn't do anything useful. So you may be wondering, like, where is the constructor on this student class, right? How do I, because this, you know, again, this looks like I'm creating an object, and that's what's happening. There is no new keyword in, in Kotlin, but this is creating an object. It takes two parameters. Those parameters seem to map down to that declaration of the data class on line one, but it's sort of like, how did this name get copied into a student.name, which, which it has, right? So this student object has two fields that I can access if I want. Why this is slow today, um, right? It also has an age field, okay? So this syntax that we've been seeing is, is known as a primary constructor syntax in Kotlin, right? We've been looking at the constructor. And, and the way to parse this is essentially these, any um, parameter to the constructor, that's marked with a val or a var. So when we write methods in Kotlin, our method parameters don't take val or var keywords, right? So that's sort of unusual about the primary constructor. It's one of the things that this primary constructor is like, it's, a, it's an interesting mix of syntax that you would normally see for declaring instance variables and syntax that you would see for a method, right? It looks sort of like a method declaration, 
right? It's got a list of parameters separated by commas inside parentheses, but I've also got keywords that I associate, might associate normally with an instance variable, okay? And that's kind of your clue about what it's doing, because it's sort of doing both things, right? This defines the method signature for the constructor, for the primary constructor for this class, but it also enumerates the fields that I'm going to be have available on the student file. Right? And for a data class, this makes a lot of sense that these two things align with each other. I mean, how many people have written a Java class that just, a Java constructor that just copies its fields into the variables that are named the same thing on the object, right? Like that's what you do, right? And you're hoping that you're getting paid by the line number of lines of code that you write. Um, in Kotlin, we don't do that, right? So this does exactly that, and we get it for free, right? Um, and so this is, and, and, and again, this, this just works, right? It just does the right thing, but you kind of have to, rem you have to remember to look for these modifiers, right? Because this tells us something about the type of instance variable that's being created, right? This is a immutable instance variable. It's only something I can set in the constructor. This is a mutable instance variable. Um, I can set it in the constructor and then I can modify it. By default, these parameters are, are public, particularly in a data class, right? That's kind of, again, what data classes are for, right? I'm trying to bring together different pieces of data into a single record, right? It wouldn't necessarily make a lot of sense to have a private val. I actually want to see if this will work. Let me see if I can mark this as private. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So I can, right, if I want to, and then I can just print the name. So I can also include visibility modifiers. By default, um, instance variables in Kotlin are public, okay? That's a, that's a difference from Java, right? So what's the default Java visibility modifier? If I don't include one, good piece of Java trivia, anybody know? Yeah, nope, close. Package private, right? The stupid Java default that makes no sense. So. Yeah, package private. And the best thing about package private is you can't even use package private. If you write down package private, it's like a syntax error, right? So here in Kotlin, if I want to, I can mark things as public. Um, it's sort of um, not needed, right, because it's the default, but at least it's a valid keyword, right? But by default, these are public, then I can get access to them. I can also mark them as private if I need them internally. Okay, so. And so again, the idea of having this primary constructor um, in your class, the primary constructor is not required. We're about to see cases where I don't have to provide it. But the idea of having a primary constructor is really powerful because it reflects a really common design pattern, right? I mean, you know, at some point, someone who is writing a lot of Java code noticed, hey, if I can get the, if, if people are using a feature that allows them to automatically generate constructors, why doesn't the language just allow us to do that automatically, right? That seems like kind of a silly thing to look at, right? Yes, you can get the compiler to, to generate it for you, but then it's hanging out in your code, taking up space, and you have to think about it. All right, so, so this syntax, by the way, holds is something that you can use both for data classes and for non-data classes, which we're about to look at, right? If you have fields, there's a couple of things you, you need to, a couple of requirements that need to be met for you to use this primary constructor syntax. One is that you have a field that uh, you want to be able to set in the constructor. The second requirement is um, you don't need to do anything special with that field in terms of getters and setters. This is something we're not gonna we're not gonna get to today, but we'll, we'll come back to it. Okay. But what if I want to run code in my constructor, right? You know, that's something that's powerful about constructors. I mean, even if normally the code that runs inside them is boilerplate, there's times when there's also like object specific setup that I want to do inside my constructor, right? I might want to set the size of an array or a list that I'm maintaining. I might want to combine some fields together, whatever, right? I just might want to have some code that I want to run inside the constructor. This primary constructor syntax doesn't provide me any way to do that. Right? It just basically copies whatever instance variables are declared within the primary constructor from the constructor call into the newly created object. So in order to demo this, we actually need to look at two new things in terms of how we design class. The first new thing is a field that is not set in the primary constructor because if the field is set in the primary constructor, there's no need to run more code to manipulate it. Right? 
So here, in my little example, I've created a new student class that accepts a first and a last name as strings, but I also want to expose the full name, which I'm going to create by combining the first and the last name together, okay? So the question is, how can I do this? Now this, this is already balanced, um, but there's something wrong with this, right? And let me show you what happens if I actually try to, to run this code. Okay. And this is something that, that's sort of interesting to know, right? Which is that this syntax looks a lot more like re what we were used to seeing when we declare instance variables inside class declarations in Java or, or Python, right? I declare my class, I open up a block, and then inside the class, I'm going to list off my instance methods, my instance variables, right? I have the same um, syntax inside the class as I do in the primary constructor. Inside the primary constructor list, I have the name, I have a type, and I have valor var indicating whether or not the variable is mutable or not. The problem here that the Kotlin compiler has identified is that it's not it can't convince itself that this field is actually set after the object is created, okay? I said this field is a non-nullable string. I have not set a default value. I could do that. And Kotlin's looking at my class and it's saying, hey, I don't see how that gets set, right? Um, so it's basically telling me properly must be initialized. There's also a way to create an abstract property that we're not going to talk about, but it, it doesn't matter, right? So basically, the, the error here is that property must be initialized. How do I do this? I do this using this um, piece of code that's known as an init block. Okay, so here's our first example of an init block. This is the syntax. I use the keyword init. I open up a block. The code in there runs when the primary constructor runs. You can think of it as running after the primary constructor, right? So in this case, when I construct, when I call uh, the constructor down here, again, there's no new keyword in Kotlin, so this is, but this is the equivalent. I'm calling the constructor for the class. I'm passing the two fields that I have to pass to the primary constructor, so my student object is going to have a first uh, field that's going to be a string, and a last field that's going to be a string. So those two things get copied into the object, and then this piece of code runs, this init block. And what it does is it sets a third field on the object and it just uses string interpolation to combine these two things together. And inside these init blocks, I can do whatever I want, just code, right? I can examine my inputs, I can set other fields, whatever, right? But these run when the primary constructor runs, okay? So, um, and again, you can think of it as running after. And they have access to all of the same fields that were passed to the primary constructor. Now, right now, these fields are also instance variables on instances of the class student, but we're gonna look at uh, cases in a minute where I can pass fields to the constructor that don't get copied into the class, okay? On a data class, they always do, but on a more generalized class, they don't have to. I can pass arguments to the constructor that don't automatically get attached to the class. So here again, creating a name, and now, if we run this code, you'll see that the name, the error above has gone away, and the reason is Kotlin can convince itself that the name gets set, right? So when Kotlin analyzes this code, it says, okay, what happens in the, it looks for the fields on the class, it says, okay, I see a first field, a last field that are set in the primary constructor, I see a name field that's initialized within the class body, and then it says, okay, can I convince myself that the name field is actually going to be set every time that the class is created? And in this case, it can because it's set right here inside the init block. Any questions about things up to this point? David. Yeah. Let's try it. I don't think that's necessarily true. Yeah, no, no. So if I make it nullable, it still wants me to set it to something. Right? So I can make it nullable and then I can initialize it to null. That's one option, right? So now I'm okay, except that I'm printing null, right? I could also make it non-nullable and initialize it here, right? Um, to, to be honest, 
there's also, I'll show you something in a minute. There's also an even nicer, cleaner way to do this, right? Um, but any, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, good question. So the question is, what's the difference between that and this? So now I've declared a local variable inside my, my init block. Right, so this variable is gone when the init block goes away. Right, so this you can do this, and there's times when you need to. Right, like let's say you're doing some work inside the init block, but if it's inside the init block, it's not declared as part of the block. That make sense? Yeah, great question. All right, any other questions? Yeah. Ah, yes, exactly. So the question is, can I just set name? You mean right here? Yeah, and and you can. So this was a slightly contrived example to kind of show you guys how to what what you can do with init blocks. But I can also just do this. Uh, can I run a thing too? There you go. Yeah. So again, this is even more ergonomic, right? As as you might put it, in the sense of as Kotlin is going through and evaluating the default values of the class, this is done essentially after the primary constructor runs, right? So this is this can be done as well. This is a nice nice piece there. If you need to do something more complicated, um, like actually run some code or whatever, in a block's a good uh, good choice for that. This sort of works in pretty much the same way. Other questions? Cool. Okay. So now let's look at some of the differences between. Uh, so now we're going to look at non-data classes or just classes going forward, trying not to call them non-data every time, and look at how they work a little bit differently and why, right? Some of the things about them, okay? So data classes give us some freebies. We get the copy constructor, we get equals, we get two strings, but they also have some limitations um, that, that can cause them to not necessarily be the right choice for every job, right? One thing that we can't do in a data class is we can't have a data class that has an empty constructor. So this doesn't work, okay? Now, you might wonder, well, does every Kotlin class have to have a primary constructor? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Data classes, however, have to have a primary constructor that declares at least one field. So this won't work, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to create a person um, but my, I'm, I'm missing a, a primary constructor, right? Even though this person object in theory has several of the fields, right? If I remove the data modifier, then this works fine, right? So this is now, again, this looks a lot more like Java. This is a class that declares an immutable field name name, which it sets to an empty string, an immutable field name age. That's probably a little dumb because why have these fields if I can't set them? Let's at least make let's at least make the age something that I can modify. Yeah, there we go. Um, but again, this now looks a lot more like maybe what you used to in Java, right? Um, okay. So now the question is, if I have something like this, how do I set the value? in when I initialize the class, right? Because again, I mean, when we, when, when we start talking about classes um, in, in 125, we do so before we get to constructors. But with because we started talking about data classes first, you guys kind of saw the primary constructor and how that's being used. So now the question is, how do we write constructors for our, for our non-data classes? And now we need to distinguish between now we need to look at the difference between a parameter to the constructor and to the primary constructor and a field that is declared within the primary constructor. That's my best way of talking about it so far. Part of, you know, part of why I'm doing this is to get practice at how to talk about Kotlin. So this probably is the better way to do this and I'll figure it out at some point. All right, so let's look at these two examples. Okay, neither one of these is a data class. Both has a primary constructor, right? There's only one difference between these two. And here, I've marked this as a val, and here I didn't. 
It turns out that it has a big difference in how this behaves. When you mark something as a val in the primary constructor, it becomes a field on the class, right? So this will work fine because I've declared by marking this with a val in the primary constructor list that every person has a name field, which I can set using the default constructor and access later. If I don't do that, the constructor will still accept this parameter, right? So I still have a single argument constructor that takes a string, but the person will not have a name field. So if I try to run this code, Kotlin is gonna tell me that name is unresolved, okay? So again, just I stick a val on here or a var, it doesn't matter. Now every person has a name field, a name instance variable. If I take this off, I have the same constructor, but I don't have that the class doesn't have a field. So this is the this is a way of creating a constructor. So we're kind of like working our way backwards from these default constructors that behave a lot like the default constructors you can generate for Java to a more general constructor that basically works like the constructors that we can write out of the box in Java, which is it just takes a bunch of arguments and does whatever it wants. It's just a method call, all right? Now, you might wonder, what do I do with the parameters that are passed to my person class, right? So here, I've got, and, and this is not a useful example, right? Because there's no constructor that's accepting these. I don't have a body of my constructor, right? And there's two things. One is that I can use them inside an init block. I could also use them directly right here, the way we did before, right? I think this is a nicer way to think about it. So now, you can think about it that my primary constructor takes two parameters. Neither one of these parameters declares a field. And then I copy them over onto the fields that I've declared on my object inside the init block. So this is now very close to what you would see in Java, right? Or what, what you know, the... IntelliJ were generate for you, right? The idea that my class declares two fields, my constructor copies the arguments that it's passed into the fields that are declared on the class. Right. Of course, my constructor doesn't have to do that with the field. My constructor could do other things, right? So for example, let's say that, you know, let's, let's revisit our example from before. Well, you know what, let's say that we want to, to take a name and store like a first name and a last name. So we'll say first name string and last name. It's also a string. And now I'm going to do first name is equal to name dot split first So now I've got a first name, a last name, I take in a full name. Let's see if this works. Oh, I need to set name. There you go. And let's look at the last name. Make sure we did this properly. Yeah. This won't work if you put a put a middle name, well actually it will, it will work. The middle name's just gonna get ignored. Just in case you're wondering, split works very similarly in Kotlin to what you're used to in Java. The nice thing about Kotlin though is I get these first and last operators that operate on a list. They do what you think. First gives you the first element, last gives you the last element. You know, is this foolproof? No, of course it's not foolproof. If I pass in something like this, then my first name is my last name. Probably not, not ideal, but it's just a quick example. Right. So again, now I've got a way to allow my constructors to take arbitrary parameters, um, use those parameters to set fields on the, the object. And as somebody pointed out before, I could actually do something like this. I could write this directly in here, I 
could write this directly in here. So I could avoid the init block entirely. There you go. Yeah. So these can be assigned using the values that are passed. Right? The difference is that when this is done, I don't have a set name field. That's just a parameter that's being passed to my constructor. Questions? That all makes perfect sense. All right, good. Right, ah, okay. So, and again, this is another place where Kotlin's analysis is going to help you out, right? So here's a little bit more complicated example. Um, the here I'm setting the name only if the age is greater than a particular value. So remember, Kotlin does static analysis when it's looking at your code, tries to figure out if this is something that's okay to do, right? Um, and what it needs to convince itself here is that this name field is always set before the you know the primary constructor finishes, after the primary constructor finishes. So, you know, it runs the init block, and here, because there's a branch in my code in which name doesn't get set, it's going to complain. It's going to basically give me that error I had before, because Kotlin is smart enough to know that there's a, there's a path through this code where a name doesn't get set. I think if I stick an else block in here, now I should be okay, right? So, you know, the static analyzer in Kotlin is pretty good, right? It knows by an else block and by my if. Now there's no chance that I can fall through this code in a way that would prevent the name from being set. All right, cool. All right, so let's let's look at something else that's uh, actually not on these slides yet, but but something that we that we should talk about. So, so one question would be how do we write a how do we write another constructor, right? So let's go up. Let me get one of one of these guys here. Well, maybe what I'll do is I'll just open up one of these and let's just font's a little bigger here. All right, so I'm going to create a person class. It's usually pretty, pretty reasonable. So, so one thing to keep in mind too, and unfortunately I didn't include this on the slide, right, um, on the lesson yet, is that in Kotlin um, I can provide default values for parameters that are passed to methods, and that includes to the primary constructor, okay? So, and this is, should be familiar to you if you've used Python, right? The idea of being able to provide default values. So let's say that I have a person and I want to make sure that they have a name, which is not modifiable. They have an age, which is something that can change. Yeah, see, this is a bad day for me to do this because my D key is like, last leg, whatever. Um, let's say I want to set a default value for that. I could just do it like this. Let's say that we say it's right. So this will actually work fine and allow me to create person instances and do stuff that I might want to with them. Get rid of this guy. Right. So this this pattern, right? of being able to provide default values actually kills off at least a few of the use cases for, for secondary constructors, right? Because now what I really have here is I have two constructors, right? I have one constructor in which I provide both fields and one constructor in which I omit the age. And if I have, you know, two or three or four other um, fields on this constructor, I can provide, um, you know, I can provide defaults for those as well. Um, Kotlin also allows me to slightly more complicated example. So let's have an age. What, are, what, what else do people have? I don't know. Uh, how about a number of children? Ah, that would be in it. That would be in it. This is an int. Let's set that equal to zero, right? Um, So now if I do children, this is zero. Is that real? No. But I can also 
to set this. So now the question is, what happens if I want to set the number of children that this person has, but not the age? I can do this using a named argument. So all these nice things I like about Kotlin come. How many children do I have? Ten? It seems excessive, but um, right. So, so this, just this alone, right? The ability to provide these named arguments um, and provide default values gives me a lot of basically provides me with a lot of other ways to, to write constructions. But if I want to provide, so the question is, what if I want to provide another constructor? So in Kotlin, the way I do this is I use a constructor keyword within my class body, and this declares something that's known as the secondary constructor. So let's create a secondary constructor, and for why don't we have that, why don't we create a copy constructor for this, since this is a not a data class, and so it doesn't have a copy constructor. Okay. Now, here's the only thing that's a little bit um, tricky about constructors that I've run into in Kotlin. If you write another constructor, and this is not true in Java, right? So remember, in Java, a secondary constructor can delegate to, sorry, in Java, a constructor can delegate to another constructor. So I can write a constructor in Java, and it can call this, and use that to make a call to a different constructor that takes a different argument, okay? In Kotlin, you have to do this. There's no option. You have to, a secondary constructor, the first thing it does is it has to delegate to the primary constructor. The way I do that is, is very much the same. I call this, but I can't, like, do some computated, complicated computation and then call the primary constructor. So here, the way I would do it, I would just uh, do something like this. Let's say another person dot, we'll just copy the name for now. This should run. And I can't, okay, so that's, yeah. So the, the, the secondary constructor list can't, crea can't create new fields on the object either, right? It can only take parameters. But now this should, this should work. Now I need to call it with my first person. I'm gonna just make sure that we copy the name properly. cooperate with me today. Um, this, is, this is the syntax for doing this, but there's, there's something broken with the playground working with these certain commands. So. All right. All right. Any questions at this point? Yeah. Oops. Sorry. Can I store a function in a data class? Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, you know, Good question. So, so Colin support for, well, we can do that right here. So Colin support for first class functions allows me to, to store a function anywhere, right? So let's uh, example, and then let's take this, take a, uh, we'll say val runner, that's going to be a function that returns an int, takes no arguments and returns an int. We'll make this, we'll make actually make this a data class. Come on. All right, it's not going to be live though. There we go. Right. Do you guys remember back a few weeks ago our function declaration syntax? So this says this class stores a single field called runner. That field is a function that takes no arguments and returns an int. All right, so. This will work fine. Let's create a couple of examples here. So we'll say example. And now I need to pass a function that takes no arguments and returns an int. Um, I think this will work. Let's see if we're happy with that. Yep. Let's take another one.
that. I know. I gotta keep one D on my screen at all times now. That's what, uh, this is what I've been reduced to. Okay. Um, all right. So now, what's in there, right? This is kind of a fun example. Is is a is a closure. It's an anonymous function that just yields a number. So now let's actually call this. So we'll do println first dot runner. It's gonna print four, and now we'll print len second dot runner. Nope, I didn't use second because I don't need the e right now. Yeah. Yeah. So your fields in your data class can be anything. Other classes, functions. Um, you know, we can make this arbitrarily complicated. Um, this can be a, th there's definitely some use cases for this. I've, I've done this, right? Um, there's some times when, um, so there's times when like you have two different, you want to provide different instances with of a class with different ways of, um, of performing the same function, right? You want them to be able to customize it when you create it so you can do that in this way. So actually, let's look at an example of this, right? Um, let's create, okay, here we go. Let's create our person class again, and we'll say, um, we'll say, going to yield a string. Right. So, now, so now let's say, oh, and then let's actually give them a, a, an age as well. Okay. Actually, this is still, this is still work fine. Okay. So, and then, and, and actually these can also have default values, right? So I could say, um I find age years old. Now this should be able to access values on the class. So let's see if this works. Um, so we're gonna give them an age of 40. And then we're gonna say person dot announce birthday. Oh, I have to print it. There you go. Uh, 40 years ago. Old. See, I was sub I'm subconsciously avoiding a D. <laughs> I have a space. Okay. Um, but let's say, like, you have someone who's, like, wants to lie about their age, for example. Um, so now let's create another person. Equals old shy person. 40. And then... What they're going to say is, I'm 18 years old. And then we'll do the same thing. Uh, I spelled it wrong. Or, yeah, I spelled it wrong because I don't have a D. There we go. Yeah. So, and, and, and again, this is sort of cool, right? Because now I'm, I'm able to customize behavior on a per class level. There's other ways to do this. I could have, you know, shy person be a, a, a inherit from person and override a method that did this. But but this is actually pretty neat and pretty cool. Right? This can be pretty useful. Any questions? All right. Let's. How much time do we have? Still have time. It's all right. Let's let's give it a try. So let's go back to our. Let's go back to this quickly, um, because there were a few places in our example here where. Um, where it would have been nicer to do things a little bit differently. And so what we're going to do is our main method. All right. So we got to the point where we had, and we'll just work with this quickly, right? And we'll, we'll, com we'll come back to this next week, right? So we essentially had a way where we received a calculator request, and then we um, basically built a result object that we're going to return to the user from the operation and the operand. Okay. And what I'm going to suggest is that we move this logic into the class. Right? So right now, 
all we've used up here is a data class, okay? Uh, we have a data class that, that has an operation, a first and a second, and then we have a result, okay? And we can really, you know, we can really sort of combine both of these together, okay? We can essentially create one class that accepts the request parameters, and when it's built, right, actually calculates the result, okay? So here's what we're going to do. So we're going to take our request class. Th this is fine right now, right? This has the right parameters. This is actually what's passed in. Um, but what we want to do is we want to we want to set the result. So we're going to add a result field to this class. Well, actually, we need to actually we need to return a result, right? So let, let's do the following. Let's let's write a compute method. Let's have that compute method return a result. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll move this up here. Oh, sorry. All right. Sorry, got to move this guy. All right. Now what I'm going to do is just I'm I'm operating on my own my own operand. Now I'm going to return this result object. So I'm going to return the result that contains the same parameters that we had before. And okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say call dot respond request. So essentially what we did is we moved the logic that we had lurking in this calculate method and we've now moved it into our calculator request class. Okay. So the calculator request class now has all the information that it needs to actually um, perform the, the operation. Okay. Um, and if we wanted to do this, we might want to actually just do this when it's, you know, we, we, we could actually even just do this when it was actually constructed and just return the result, right? So actually, let's do that. That'll be fun. Um, we'll say val result result. And then here we'll say result is equal to, we're going to change this to be our init block. Oh yeah. Um, we could call this something else. Mm. All right, cool. Yeah. So now down here, what we're going to do is we'll just do return request dot result. So now what happens is. As soon as, so again, as soon as this calculator request is created, the operation first and second come in through the JSON conversion that we were doing. But as soon as this is created, this init block is run. So this is a place where this is the kind of calculation that we would want to do inside an init block. We really wouldn't want to tr try to do that here. We can't do it directly. We perform the mathematical operation that was requested, and we save the result into this field on the object. And now, this piece of code has gotten a lot simpler, right? Because as soon as this request is created, the result has already been computed, right? What's one reason that we might want to do it this way instead of leaving the computation logic inside our calculate method? What would this make it easier to do, potentially? Something we like to do, something we're about to do? So now all of the logic for, for performing the math is actually encapsulated inside the request class. So what should that make it easier to do to the request class? Yeah. 
test it. Bingo. Yeah. So before, the only way to test the, the, this, this, the, the math was correct was actually to perform this web request. But I don't want to do that every time. So now, you know, if I go back into my test suite, right, let's just add a test class in here. We'll do call this test request. That's fine. Go back here, grab our starter starter code system called test request. So now what I can do is I can say should <laughs> is there a D here? Nope. Test should oh this is gonna be really bad. Yeah, this keeps really okay. I'm gonna get one. Should add properly. So then I'm gonna say how this looks. So what do I need to pass? I need to pass an operation and two operands. So request add three four dot sorry, where's my request object? Oh, the calculator request, sorry. Calculator request. Right. Result, nope, result dot, result should be not. And is this open up? Okay. Yeah, so now I can write these tests directly against my, my request object, right? To make sure that the math is working properly. Um, you know, and so in, in general, Whenever we can, oh, I'm just angry about something. Oh, I need to import this to the master. Oh, yeah, there we go. All right, let's run this again. Okay, there it goes. So, you know, essentially what we did here is we were able to, to pull out. Now, so again, why is this a good thing? Whenever we write web APIs, what we want is we want the web API part to do as little work as possible. Any work that's in here, any logic that's inside this handler is logic that I can only test by actually making a web API request, right? Now that I've moved the interesting bits into this class, I can write tests against my calculator request class to make sure that it does things that I expect. And I know that when I stick it inside of that web API framework, it's going to work the way I want, right? So now if I was continuing to work on this, I would probably do something like, you know, let's write another, let's write another test for this class. I don't know why this is weird, but we can just reformat it. Oops. Right. So let's multiply work. Should be 20. Is that going to work? It's not going to work, right? Because we have we don't support multiply now, right? So now I go back and you know we can fix this failing test, and know that once I stick it inside, this this value is going to work, right? So as we go forward, we'll try to we'll try to follow this pattern, this strategy, right? Which is, you know, our our web requests are really just handling deserializing the the request. You know, the request object does most of the work, and then we just write a response back to the client, right? Because, again, I believe that JSON works properly. So I believe that giving JSON, it can deserialize the calculator request properly, assuming that the JSON is valid. I also believe that given a request object, it can create, it can serialize JSON to send back to the client, right? What I'm not sure about is whether or not my calculator request work class works properly. So that's the part that I'm going to focus on a little bit. All right, cool. So I think next week we'll kind of do this again. We'll um, kind of bounce back and forth a little bit between um, some of the some of the sort of more basic outflow material, and then we'll come back to this example. Right? If 
if there's anything you guys, so at this point, um, you know, I've got some things that we'll probably talk about throughout the rest of the semester. If there's anything you guys want to talk about, um, either from the aspect of kind of the different Kotlin things, I mean, you guys have seen most of the basics now. We'll probably dive into some more interesting topics. I think it'd be really fun to do some concurrency. Uh, so we'll probably definitely talk about coroutines, which are pretty cool. Um, I'd like to get to the point where you guys are actually able to deploy this little web API backend. I have a idea of how to do that. I've been ex exploring some different options. So we'll talk a little bit about how to containerize it and then how to get it up onto um, something like uh, Amazon's uh, container service. Um, so that'd be kind of neat. That's like a real way that you would deploy stuff um, in the real world. Um, other than that, again, I'm sort of open to ideas. If you guys have particular things you want to discuss, libraries you want to use, features of the language that you're interested in, in exploring, um, we c we'll get there. Right? We have time. So, All right, cool. Have a great weekend. I'll see you guys on Wednesday.